The Disappearing L, Erasure of Lesbian Spaces and Culture by Bonnie J. Morris. Chapter 5, Points of Erasure, Remembering Generation Flannel. Mainstreaming the Cultural Lesbian. For most tribal groups throughout history, cultural storylines disappear when war, natural disaster, or ethnic removal policies disperse a living people. Over time, European-directed genocide and colonizer practices eradicated many, but not all, First Nations and Aboriginal peoples. Through disease and slaughter, land seizure, capture, and separation of families, rape and slavery, banning of languages and practices, renaming of places, and intentional introduction of alcoholism. In the unique case of the Holocaust, entire villages vanished, hundreds of years of community gone forever, and even now, only a few such sites are marked with any sort of memorial. The Nazis burned books, too, disappearing history by destroying the magnificent archival collection of Magnus Hirschfeld, whose library documented so much of gay history up to that point in Europe's time. Gone, irretrievable. These are hor horrific events stemming from ideologically plotted campaigns carried out by those in power at the time. This is not the case with the cyclical appearing and vanishing of lesbian culture, which has been less tied to one geography or regime across time. The dismissal of lesbian lives tends to be episodic, usually when a more repressive era follows a tolerant one, but can also be attributed to a deliberate misreading of the historic record over time. In some instances, the disappearance of lesbian culture certainly included physical attacks. The purging of female homosexuals as a named category was very much part of the Holocaust, though to a lesser degree than the rounding up of identifiable gay men. But another reason for cultural disappearance is assimilation, the vanishing of a surviving people hides in plain sight. Difference itself. Humans outlive their original categories. The unresolved question for the LGBT community is how to retain a certain uniqueness and acknowledged heritage of struggle while politically petitioning for recognition under the law. We've seen how the disappearance of community spaces, institutions, and events results from varied factors, economic loss, aging elders, more lesbian-friendly vacation, vacation and business options, and the next generation's reliance on social media and Kindle rather than their local women's bookstore. Perhaps the greatest changes are due to the LGBT community's rapid normalizing in just one decade, beginning with the 2003 Lawrence v. Texas decision overturning state sodomy laws, thus decriminalizing same-sex relationships. This still ongoing shift from felon and pariah to mainstream status includes legal protection many activists never thought we'd see in our lifetimes, from gay marriage to open military service to anti-bullying statutes in schools. While such hard-won steps have of course been celebrated by most gay men and lesbians, the sudden possibility of full citizenship contrasts starkly with the underground culture of the recent past, when two women risk their lives, jobs, and child custody simply by attending an Alex Dobkin concert. Victory and loss almost come hand in hand, as seen in the news headlines following the June 26, 2015 Supreme Court decision in favor of same-sex marriage. The front page of the June, June 27 New York Times declared equal dignity, but beneath the fold was historic day for gay rights, but a twinge for the loss of gay culture. Jody Cantor's front page analysis quoted filmmaker John Waters's commencement speech at the Rhode Island School of Design, quote, refuse to isolate yourself. Separatism is for losers. Gay is not enough anymore, end quote. It's important to distinguish between false nostalgia for actual and brutal inequality and nostalgia for creative ways we risked being out and proud in homophobic society. Our olden days are marked by an inevitable separatism that stemmed from being unable to vacation as a lesbian couple anywhere but at a lesbian festival or lesbian-owned bed and breakfast. 
from being unable to find books on lesbian lives and history anywhere but on the shelves of an independently run feminist bookstore. Shut out of mainstream institutions, we formed our own. There are obvious benefits that come with full protection, full legal protection, health coverage for one's partner, school libraries that include books like Heather Has Two Mommies, but how best to honor those independent lesbian institutions that served our community in an era lacking any other pride-based services? Once Heather Has Two Mommies landed at Barnes & Noble, lesbian moms no longer had to trek to Lama's Books, my DC women's bookstore, which closed forever. As of this writing, my local Barnes & Noble has also closed. Film is replacing some of the print literature that once filled in gaps of knowledge about who we were. The 2014 film, She's Beautiful When She's Angry, directed by Mary Dore, interviewed radical feminism's leaders from the 1960s and early 1970s, many of whom were also out as lesbians. Larger than life on screen, they challenged their sold-out audiences from city to city in stark terms. Quote, we live in a country that doesn't like to credit its radical activists, end quote, warned Susan Brown Miller, author of Against Our Will. Quote, we cannot retire from women's issues, end quote, declared historian Ruth Rosen. Alexis Clements, working on a documentary about lost lesbian spaces, reminded the New York lesbian blog Velvet Park that preserving where and how lesbians gathered is complicated by women's frequent use of households as social sites. Quote, the lesbian history archives in Brooklyn literally began and lived within the home of two of its co-founders, Deborah Edel and Joan Nessel, for years. Why people gather in homes and personal spaces has a lot to do with the accessibility or inaccessibility of other spaces in terms of economics, in terms of who makes decisions when the space is shared with people other than queer women, in terms of safety. All of that contributes to these spaces being illegible for many people in the larger culture, end quote. To see how acceptance into the mainstream creates challenges for the preservation of a distinct cultural heritage and identity, one need only look at Jewish history. It offers clear examples of how a group long vilified as other and threatened with church and state-sanctioned violence across centuries of time forged survival and mutual support as well as material legacy of art, music, literature, theater, and theory. But in coming to America with its many freedoms and protections, Many Jewish immigrants soon fell away from religious practices altogether. Some changed their names, learned to like barbecued spare ribs, and put on Christmas trees like everyone else on the block. The physical survival of a Jew did not mean the cultural survival of Judaism. To remain true to religious practices, more Orthodox and Hasidic Jews chose voluntary separation, following dietary laws of... Kashruth, which restricted where and with whom they might eat, and enrolling their children in private Jewish schools so that they would meet and marry other Jews and continue the lineage. Plenty of now Americanized Jews dislike such self imposed ghettoization and the clannish reputation created by Orthodox Jewish communities living apart. Both traditional and assimilated Jews have joined voice joined voices in demanding that harm that hires a Santa or sets up a Christmas manger in the equal time, equal representation, and equal val validation in Western culture. Jews who have forgotten how to pray all together will be watching films like The Fiddler on the Roof, accepting a sentimental view of the supposed authentic past, though disciplined to, to perpetuate it. Oh, disinclined to perpetuate it. With so much rapid change, plenty of people look with nostalgia and affection and affection to traditions they can't commit to for the long haul, just as many non-observant Jews yearn for a good kosher deli in town so the authentic taste of Jewish culture is there when desired, 
aging traditional lesbians will soon feel that need for nostalgia, nostalgic authenticity when younger LGBT activists look to interview an old 1970s dyke. These are some of the trends we are seeing in the current mainstreaming of LGBT culture. The women's bookshop slash music festival era of the 1970s and 80s has become the old country, where lesbians once found pride and identity through celebration and consumer practices only a small percentage of our straight allies knew about, supported, or freely participated in. If that is the older lesbian's past, then to continue to self-identify as a dyke or lesbian rather than queer, is the equivalent of speaking with an old country accent. The sites of women-only spaces, like some of our grandparents' villages, are no more. Yet some of us stay orthodox in practice. More than any other lesbian institution in recent American history, the Michigan Festival has been vilified for maintaining a boundary of separation within which certain practices and holidays may continue. Its boundary, its eruv, was an imaginary line wrapped around those who brought a woman-born identity. Its extended household, the range of female bodies born as girls. Tevye's Daughter let us compare nostalgia for lesbian feminist culture to the Jewish nostalgia enacted through Fiddler on the Roof. We might view lesbian feminists of the past as embodying a frozen moment in time, one we can appreciate through the filter of an imagined Hollywood film screen. Here are lesbians of 1976, 1984, 1992, weaving in and out of festivals and bookshops and overalls and labrys jewelry, just as in Fiddler, Fiddler Tevye's daughter invoked village life in Russia in a Russian shtetl by wearing shawls and carrying milk pails. Yet, if one recalls the 1971 film version of Fiddler on the Roof, within two hours, Tevye's three older daughters each reject Jewish tradition for choices of their own, choices escalating in levels of rebellion. The oldest daughter chooses a, her partner, her own partner, without a matchmaker. The middle daughter elopes with a non-observant Marxist radical. And finally, the youngest marries a Gentile Russian peasant and is pronounced dead to the family by her anguished, outraged father. Tevye sees his own children reject most old country ways before he himself is rejected by anti-Semitic edict, physically uprooted and expelled from the place that held a boundary around Jewish life and ritual. In the end, it is not Tevye's daughters who will be reliable as transmitters of culture to the next generation. That burden still rests with patriarchs and displaced and anguished father, sorry, the displaced and anguished father, the elderly rabbi willing to, quote, wait for the Messiah somewhere else, end quote, as he carries the Torah scroll to another destination in his frail arms. In transit, the Jewish ability to adapt, to carry a transportable culture across frozen seas is significant in the final shot by the eponymous fiddler who plays the music of life's joy and miseries as he too walks to a new road. Today, we might see a parallel in lesbian culture's metaphoric shifts. Tevye's daughters are those women who questioned the rigidity of politically correct lesbian culture in the 1970s and 80s and split off in order to raise sons or to sleep with men or even ultimately to become trans men. Those who have remained part of the separate spaces and institutions within lesbian community upholding certain notions of apartness are like Orthodox Jews, faulted by the present queer movement for climbing to a ghetto mentality and of failing to assimilate where modern possibilities and choices exist. Both traditional Jews and traditional lesbians are scolded for preferring or preserving their own communal functions, charged with averse discrimination, fear, short-sightedness, and or failing to pursue timely alliances. The assumption is, given complete free reign in a hate-free society, who would want to be limited at all by religion, ethnicity, sexual, or gender identity? Offered the supposed prize of assimilation, the traditionalist response, is partaking of your mainstream all that great? Do I want to imitate my oppressor? 
Maybe I don't want to join the military, have a church wedding, eat ham. Moreover, the prize of assimilation is assimilating into a pre-established hegemony determined by neither Jews nor queers. This refusal of what is supposedly privilege is hardly limited to Jewish or LGBT identity. Sports analyst Tom Joyner, a longtime defender of independent black media, once told an interviewer, quote, Look, I'm a race man. Why would I want to be buried in a white graveyard? End quote. Judaism, at least, has a divine storyline, the chosen people. The 613 laws and directives were presumably set down by God. Separation and separatism run throughout the Hebrew scriptures, beginning with keeping the Sabbath day separate and holy and forbidding categories of work on holy days. Categories of pure slash impure, required slash forbidden, include the most intimate of activities. Jewish women must not sleep with their husbands during their menstrual periods, and this in turn sets up a calendar of clean slash unclean days for sex. Kosher food laws virtually guaranteed that Jews could not break bread with others. Many of the tactless theorists who have suggested that Jewish clannishness, dietary and sex laws, made anti-Semitism inevitable. For Jewish believers, living apart from non-Jews was pr predicated tribally on needing community practitioners who adhered to Jewish laws. A Jewish neighborhood required a shochet, a kosher slaughterhouse, and a mikvah, the ritual bath for wives post-menstrual immersion. Otherwise, Orthodox Jews can neither eat nor make babies. Such communal needs generated jobs and employment structures for women as well as men, resulting in a self-reliant community. There are many overlaps with gay and lesbian culture. While lesbians certainly may view themselves as special, the rulebook of lesbian practices is anything but clear or divinely sanctioned. We had no Moses, the lawgiver, and our diversity includes enormous race and class division. Sappho is hardly every lesbian's cultural foremother. Furthermore, without a husband or male income, lesbian couples throughout history have lacked the financial clout and independence that permitted some gay men to create stylish alternative lifestyles. The media utilizes one specific and recognizable stereotype, the white 1970s tofu-eating lesbian in Birkenstocks, who serves as the old-school orthodox lesbian, rejecting assimilation even today. The orthodox lesbian is she whose cultural practices have not faltered or evolved. She worships traditionally. Her temple is a women's music festival. In this way, the most radical women in America, who gave up marriage and often motherhood, and broke every biblical taboo including unclean sex, were recast as the progressive LGBT movement's embarrassing traditionalists. <laughs> One solution to erasure is making sure archives and historians present an accurate legacy. For anyone with something to pass along to the next generation, lucid awareness of one's coming extinction grants a measure of power over how the stuff should be passed along. I experienced this in my own family. Rather than submit passively to a long illness, my father took astonishing control over his own dying, using the weeks when he could no longer take nourishment to arrange the disposition, sorry, the deposition of his music archives. He then plotted and ordered his own memorial service. With death approaching, he reasserted power over the meaning of his life, much of which had been uplifted and informed by the beauty of classical music. Later, I was able to distract myself from the grief over his loss by appreciating his calm decisiveness. Today, Steady changes to civil rights make it possible for my lesbian friends, too, to enact similar personal decisions about death, inheritance, and legacy without the state, in most but not all places, intervening to deny their choices. But because most discussions about inheritance or archiving are private, individual-led, and family-centered, it still feels new to initiate broader conversations about willing our lesbian papers and albums to a university. We are just starting to ask how lesbians of the 1970s, 80s, and 90s 
want their cultural experiences to be passed along, memorialized, and archived for future generations. To this end, the Sophia Smith Collection at Smith College and the Schlesinger Library at Radcliffe are amazing, phenomenal, or sorry, are amassing phenomenal resources donated by women's music artists and lesbian activists. The June Mazur archives at UCLA and, of course, the Lesbian Herstory archives in Brooklyn are two other primary repositories. For the next generations to understand what lesbians of the 1970s, 80s, and 90s contributed to a vibrant performance culture and political community, fair and equal homage must be paid and the L positioned in today's world as owning a speakable heritage. Historian Mary Corey, the author of Before Jackie, a documentary reader on Negro League Baseball, argues that minority students often fall behind in social studies when their own narratives are lacking, or in the case of African American history, when class lessons fall into categories of what was done to or done for Black people, slavery, Jim Crow, civil rights laws. Her argument is that schools pay little heed to what African Americans were doing daily in their separate, but by no means passive, community lives. Lesbians, of all races, risk seeing our heritage gradually mainstreamed into the LGBT texts with similar tropes of done to, done for, oppression, victimization, then court victories. Absent is the 40-year music and festival storyline, the bookstore and concert location of Activist Awakening. Speaking in the 1990 will, 1991 film, The Changer, A Record of the Times, one of the first documentaries about the era, era in which Olivia Records released Chris Williamson's first album, Holly Near gave this interview statement, quote, There was something happening in the 70s that will, if we let them, be completely ignored and left out of history by mainstream male-dominated historians. You hear most of the male representatives of culture say, the 60s was really when things were happening, and then the 70s and 80s were dead. And I think that's because women rose to a sense of self-value and appreciation in the 70s, and developed a cultural phenomenon that men weren't in the middle of, so they don't think it happened. If they didn't lead it, direct it, own it, profit from it, and control it, they think it didn't exist. And so, because they're in charge of the media, they will tell us, nothing happened in the 70s. End quote. As a historian, the middle generation attempting to serve as a conduit, I balance thoughtfully between this heritage of women's music movement and my younger students' demands for gender overhaul. Always missing are the monologues of my own generation, which inherit a vibrant lesbian performance culture and took up work roles within it. We are presently distracted from crediting our own contributions over 30 years as we hurry to prevent the erasure of our aging role models' cultural labor. The narrative of our generation, generation bridging, will spill over next into future books and film documentaries. For now, in choosing to archive and pay to the recent lesbian past, I have become a fiddler on that roof. To the next new destination for this trial. There is no greater pleasure than acknowledging those whose support, mentoring, assistance, and love helped bring a book into print. 
I am delighted to express my gratitude to the following persons and institutions. The, Darbra, the Barbara Deming Fund for Women granted me sufficient funds to attend the Old Lesbian Old Lesbians Organizing for Change Oral History Conference in Houston, Texas. A Hedgebrook residency on Whidbey Island allowed focus, sisterhood, and writing time for completion of one of the most challenging chapters herein. I'm grateful to Bill Leap, who has consistently invited me to present radical new work at the annual Lavender Languages and Linguistics Conference of my alma mater, the American University, and an invitation from Kath Brown to address the 2015 Lesbian Lives Conference at the University of Brighton introduced me to new research on aging lesbians presented there by scholar Jane Treus. Earlier drafts and excerpts from this manuscript appear, appear in Gay and Lesbian Review, Journal of Lesbian Studies, Ms., Gender and Music Society, and Feminist Studies. I owe immeasurable thanks to Lee's Wheel, and the writers of trivia, particularly Lynn Davis. Festival producers across the land, particularly Lisa Vogel and Lee Glanton, for rehiring me over and over. Judy DeGlatz and the entire staff at Olivia, my crewmates and co-workers at the Michigan Women's Music Festival, my fellow board members and volunteers of both the Rainbow History Project and Mother Tongue in Washington, D.C. Literary lesbian co-conspirator Julie Enser and host of the award-winning cultural role models and lesbian icons who became personal friends over the years. Jamie Anderson, Alison Bechtel, Anne Zvekovich, Alex Dobkin, Carolyn Gage, Erica Glo Gloger, Carla J, Nidra Johnson, Sarah Valentine. It's appropriate as well to give thanks to my loving family, extraordinary parents who affirmed my choices and my admirable cousin, Admirable cousin Shannon, to whom this volume is dedicated. I would not be the author of this volume without the feedback, hospitality, love, and encouragement of editor Cindy Burak and historian Lillian Faderman, whose hours of critical discussion fed my hunger for feminist affirmation and feminist knowledge. Finally, I am grateful beyond measure to the creative, sustaining love of four unique friends from the world of women's music production. My four compass points are Tony Armstrong Jr., Jeanette Buck, Tessa Melise, and Woody Simons. October 6, 2014 slash July 14, 2015.